Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for March 29th, 19, uh, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette Dalfeide. Uh, Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Read Plus, Purdue's evolution from CUI environment to an ecosystem to a community. And our presenters are Preston Smith, uh, Justin Yang, and Carolyn Ellis. Now, because we have a number of presenters um, and a lot of content, I'm going to kind of let them um, manage introducing themselves um, and just go through a few instructions before we get started. Um, first, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, second, participants are welcome to ask questions. Um, by uh, during the session by typing on the chat icon. And um, we are going to try to um, encourage people to take, uh, to ask their questions during that person's segment. So we'll try to do a, a brief break for, for outstanding questions and then we'll move on to the next presenter. And um, with that, let's get started. So um, Preston, welcome. Well, thank you much. I just stopped screen. sharing, yep. Okay, and it's showing the right the right view here. Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'll introduce myself real briefly. Uh, my name is Preston Smith. Uh, I'm the executive director for research computing at Purdue University. Uh, so I'll be going. Um, I'll be going first, talking about our experience with going from cloud to ground for our controlled environments. Um, my collaborator, Justin Yang, the PI on our project, will be talking about our support for CUI and the processes. And then Carolyn Ellis is going to bring it home by uh, talking about the regulated workshop series that is underway that I, I, I hope many of you are uh, participating in. So first I'm gonna talk about um, going from a, an environment into a secret, simple ecosystem. So this is the story of our transition from an AWS GovCloud solution to support CUI to an on-prem HPC cluster that supports uh, NIST SB 800-171. So a backstory. So the year was 2015. And for a number of years, we have, we'd operated a small on-prem uh, um, HPC cluster just on the order of uh, eight, eight to 10 nodes or so uh, for the couple of ITAR contracts that existed on campus. Uh, we had very limited physical locations where we could put this cluster It had the, the necessary us persons only processes in place and it was the only place on campus where we could where we could do um, itar data storage but in 2015 one of our researchers that was using this system on an existing contract that he had had for a number of years uh, received a new requirement from his sponsor for re requirements a requirement for compliance with uh, dfar um, uh, 7012 and therefore requiring all of the controls in NIST 800-171. Uh, we'd seen these things come through before. Our sponsored programs office and the export control office uh, would generally go back to the sponsor and attempt to negotiate on that requirement, saying that you know, we don't, you know, we don't believe that this is this is required. We have this, and we have this ITAR level uh, system in place. Is this good enough to to um, to meet the needs and and get that requirement stricken? And in this case, the sponsor would not renegotiate on that requirement. So this, of course, puts us in a bit of a bind. Um, we were given a, a, a deadline of December 31st, 2017 to have the environment in compliance. Uh, but we had a number of constraints fighting against us at the physical level. Um, secure data center space was, and frankly still is, highly limited. Um, in 2015, we knew an awful lot less than we, than we do today about what all, what all is, is necessary in supporting CUI on campus. Uh, questions were out there. It's like, what all is in scope? Does everything on campus have to be uh, be in scope of 8171 from the identity systems to the to the network to, to wh where does it begin and where does it end? Uh, and there were there were concerns that doing anything on prem would require us to undergo an expensive external audit and certification process. If I recall, um, one of the estimates that was that was um, brought up at that time was on the order of $250,000, you know, basically like, do we need a FedRAMP certification to do this sort of stuff? 
So to, to get our first system up and going, we turned to AWS GovCloud, which in a lot of ways was great. This, this let us um, solve a large chunk of those controls that, that, that we see in 800 and, and the good news, uh, we were compliant in time for that December 31st, 2017 deadline. So this system was called READ, the Research Environment for Encumbered Data. So it was a hardened environment built in GovCloud um, aligned with a NIST 800-171 that would allow us to do processing on data with strict regulations. So just a little bit about the system. You know, it was, it was a, a completely AWS uh, on enclave with an audit subsystem and administrative environment completely isolated from the project environments. Every project would get its own uh, uh, virtual private network with its own own resources that could uh, reach into the common environment that has the Active Directory and that sort of thing. Uh, we required a VPN, two-factor en encryption, all that good stuff there. Geographic limitations on the on the VPN, and uh, you know if you've ever seen those those old uh, submarine movies or where it requires two people to put a key in to launch the missile, it was that sort of uh, that sort of a process for doing data egress. Um, but an important, important thing to think about in this, and, was, and we learned for our, our second implementation, is that we landed on technical answers for most all of the 800-171 controls. So while we were compliant, uh, it worked. Uh, it wasn't terribly um, popular with the users. So we, we started looking immediately after getting the system deployed is how do we improve it or, or re-architect it? Um, there's a lot of downsides, uh, both from, doll from the financial uh, it was expensive at the end of the day. Uh, real dollars left the university. Um, it took real dollars to associate learning how to use the system. And we have a large um, HPC system on campus that is already heavily subsidized. And by doing something that leveraged none of what we had in there, we lose the ability to, to get that subsidy and instead had to do full cost recovery on everything. Just the cost of entering the system started at a 38K per project, just to, just to play, to say nothing of the, of the cloud costs. But the user experience wasn't great either. It was inflexible. Like I mentioned, there's technological controls in, um, in place for almost everything. It was a one-off. It didn't leverage any of our processes, licenses, systems, the economies of scale. And just using the system was pretty onerous to the researcher. Many of them used uh, secure systems at other places, government agencies, and, and reported that, that ours was, was far more onerous to use than theirs. Um, and then the expertise. Uh, this, you know, this could easily turn into another another lessons learned talk on being able to do cloud on campus, but we weren't able to leverage any of our existing expertise in the HPC side, um, and it's hard to grow AWS expert with limited volume. Um, we, you know, we we implemented a system that you would operate and deploy like an on-prem system in the cloud, which is you know probably not the right way to do it. So at the end of the day, we decided to go the other direction, you know, from cloud and move it back to on-prem. So what are the what are the 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 benefits? Well, uh, there's lots of usability stuff. We get to build H, something of HPC scale as we see our our fluid dynamics and hypersonics researchers um, increasingly getting hypersonics contract getting CUI contracts. Um, we we get data that's more portable. The cost gets much more uh, predictable. We have the ability for long term storage. Um, but most importantly, it's on the, on the soft things. So we get to standardize our processes like we do on all of our other computing systems. We get stateless machines like we do on the HPC systems, centralized configuration and faster connectivity between everything. Um, you know, but then at the end of the day, the, the, the university itself you know, likes, likes the system-wide benefits. We gotta be streamlined to use our community cluster processes um, and we, we get, you know, we get all the usability from our existing investments. But at the end of the day, a lot of the things that we learned in, the, in this experience was that the technology was not all the hard problems. We gave a presentation at the Educause Security Professionals Conference a couple of years ago. The supporting uh, CUI um, was a lot more than just IT problems. So we started to look at uh, Reed going from just this environment to an ecosystem. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Justin to speak about how we um, move to strengthen the ecosystem. Uh, we do have a question before we uh, okay. move to Justin. Uh, have you put your con your central authentication under full 800-171 controls? Um, I'm, I'll, Carolyn, feel free and, and hop in there, but I do not believe that, that we have. We, yeah. um, 
yeah, we we do we do have it, it is does have a, a local cache of the authentication within the enclave, but the central system is not fully um, covered by 8171. Thank you. And then um, a couple more. Uh, curious if this was your first foray into AWS or whether you were expanding to an established base of cloud knowledge. No, this was this was definitely our fir our first experience into it. So we, even even today, we we know we know enough about using AWS or other cloud providers, but it, we we probably would have we probably would have executed it differently technically. And then one more question: uh, Did you buy or build your two key egress system? It was it was built. It was a uh, it was just uh, some scripts, I believe. Correct, Carolyn. Yes, and it, it was a little messy behind the scenes. All right, great. Justin? If you're talking, you're still on mute. Hello, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to share the screen. I, um, should I share it by myself or? Let me, let I'll, me try. I'll just, operate, I'll just operate the slides. First. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Preston. Thank you uh, for the uh, wonderful background story, uh, Preston. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here today. My name is Bai Jian Yang, and I also go by Justin. I'm currently Associate Professor from the Department of Computer and Information Technology. Uh, in the part two of the, the presentation, we're talking about, well, how do we build up this uh, ecosystem within the Purdue system? So we're particularly looking at, well, how do we educate researchers and how do we empower campus IT and some of the uh, process improvement from the research administration perspective. Next slide, please. So do quick, a, a kind of rehash on what we're trying to achieve. And this is the, uh, the project that's funded by uh, NSF back in uh, September 20, uh, 2018. So we listed the four major items there and the, the top three of them are uh, educated researchers to making them, you, they understand the regulation requirements and also making sure that uh, creating this uh, campus network, um, everything is um, try our best, making sure using the NIST SP-800-171 as the framework um, to provide the CUI management. And we also want to create a single uh, process of intake, um, single uh, process of intake for uh, creating this uh, uh, process of management so that uh, everybody can have this uh, a very clear view of what, who, uh, what are different processes in there and how do they interact with each other. So this is basically what we're trying to uh, achieve in this project. And the reasons actually uh, identified on the next slides, we kind of uh, identified why we're trying to do this. So next slide, please. So if you're looking at, uh, like many other institutions, some of the problems that occur at the Purdue campus are this. For the researchers, uh, they actually have to interact with many different, uh, you know, interact with many different um, uh, organizations or different units within the uh, within the uh, university to manage those regulated data, and it's actually very complex workflow. And e sometimes even for uh, only a few thousand grants, if you're related some of the um, May, uh, some of the sensitive data, maybe even a subcontract from different organizations, but it has some of the sensitive data in there, it will ask a security analysis to do a thorough review. And in many cases, those review are kind of pretty tedious and the, can go very long and also have the IP uh, related issues there. And the pre-word uh, staff in many cases are not aware of what's going on. And uh, many of the uh, researchers have the human subjects involved. So the IRB, IRB staff have to work in, in this uh, process to understand what's going on. And uh, likewise, the uh, IT supporting staff, I mean, their main job is to try to, try to provide in the network access, desktop support. Uh, in many cases, they're not familiar with the compliance uh, uh, needs. And same thing for the research computing uh, staff. So we're just really trying to you know, solve this problem. And on the next slide, please. So, so to actually see how bad things are, we actually uh, did a survey back in the 2018. We uh, sending out uh, a just kind of a, a survey question, try to understand where we are in this process. We got about 600 responses, but many of them are not qualified for valid response. We only got 191 valid 
uh, response uh, responses. The reason is because we did this uh, a kind of negative positive uh, question pairing. We're going to ask uh, the, the audience the same question, but in two different way. So if you have uh, somebody just simply do um, any kind of uh, um, random checking, they're most likely to pick the same same answer over and over again. So we just automatically exclude those from the valid response. So with that 191 responses, we fear that uh, we, we believe those are the valid responses. And we break the, 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 the users into the participants into two groups. The first group, group A, are the ones that we thought they should probably know better. And group Bs are probably the lower risk population, If even if they don't know a whole lot. It shouldn't matter that much but the survey results really you know surprise us because if you're looking at the the group a those are the folks including the researchers faculty research staff and research administrators and they are the ones that are supposed to know the cui better but turns out only slightly better than the group b and uh, if you on the uh, turn on to the next page you will be able to see uh, some of the breakdowns when you're looking at a specific regulation. I have to point out why the numbers are so low. Uh, it is not just a perception. We're not just simply say, oh yeah, do I know about FERPA? Do I know about HIPAA? Uh, it's not exactly like that. We also ask them the questions. So we also ask them specific technical questions about the FERPA to, to really understand, uh, does the uh, participants really know about FERPA or HIPAA? And, and again, uh, it's a little bit surprised to us because we know uh, in the campus environment, when uh, you as an instructor or faculty or TA, you actually have to go through this uh, FERPA training. So our perception is, uh, um, for group A, the four part should be, you know, maybe more than 80% correct, but no, that's not the case. And we also have many people doing the NIH uh, study. So we're, saw, we we're thinking HIPAA might, might, shouldn't be a big problem for our researchers. But again, if you just look at the numbers, that doesn't seem to, you know, very a good story there. Uh, and if you go looking into the CUI and the GDPR, and the, you're basically looking at something even more miserable. So numbers are so low. Now, maybe the next slides will give you a better view in terms of this kind of perception or the knowledge. So if we look the next slides, please. And here you are, you actually have the percentage view of how the people participating in the survey can, uh, can answer the question correctly. So clearly FERPA and HIPAA uh, are, you know, people are a little bit more familiarity, but still other responses are not that great. And uh, when it comes to CUI, GDPR, you know, you're only like a 7% or 4% for our uh, researchers, I think is just, you know, kind of not acceptable. So that's basically the, where we coming from. So based on that kind of uh, a survey, you would completely understand the, 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 the picture we're gonna show you on the next slides. So please, next slide. So this is basically that view of, um, you know, for any of the researchers, you try to do research. Now your job is mostly focusing on writing a good proposal, getting the proposal funded. Once it's funded, you try to execute it as well as possible so that hopefully you can get a, you know, better, uh, you can, you can hopefully getting a, you know, more um, funding in the future. But in reality is, uh, in this process, there's so many moving parts. You actually have to write on data management plan uh, you, during the pre-award process. And uh, you have to making sure that uh, if there are any kind of uh, regulation related things, uh, making sure it's have to do a compliance review. You also have to making sure that uh, there will be support from the IT of, and the, from the research computing, getting the data very well managed. Uh, just all the different things in there. And I actually have a colleague just talk to me. It's, it's just so difficult to move things around. And he had no idea uh, he, he needed to submit a data management plan for one of the proposals. And he had no idea how to even write such a data uh, management plan. So this is basically the view we had um, you know, a few years back. So next slide, you can see how this project changed. So this is actually what we're trying to do here is uh, we're trying to move this process. We're creating this a uh, single process intake where everybody can see this big picture where, you know, this is actually a one of the uh, process map we're trying to still uh, improving, refining, but in general, everybody has a clear view of 
what is happening, how the CUI is involved in this process, and we break it down into uh, many different uh, um, the uh, stakeholders. So if you look at the PI, they can, by looking at this, they can mostly uh, focusing on the success of the program with a little bit of understanding of how, what are the different parts they're gonna interact with. The sponsored office will work with the PI on the CUI management during the pre-award and the post-award of uh, phases. The export control and research uh, information assurance is the one that uh, I believe every university have a some sort of office like this. So they are mostly a trying to monitor and manage information assurance. One of the things that actually happening right now was if you're looking at the Purdue export uh, office, we already have the CUI program at a website specifically built for you know uh, for for that type of research. It will ask users, you know, how do you know this project has a CUI component or in some cases covered uh, defense uh, information, CDI. So you really need to do this and, uh, um, and, the, and the, have that kind of information. And it also have the education component to talk about what are the CUIs and what is not CUI. And if it's CUI, what are some of the info, uh, what are forms that you're gonna need to use? So going from there, um, you also have the IT on board, making sure that the informations are all the different kind of access control authorization, authorization are well um, put into the control. And there will be a different kind of training for IT supporting stuff, making sure all the support stuff are uh, supported system are very well managed because uh, everybody on board understand it's the CUI management. It's not just IT problem. It is actually way more than just simply IT problem. So on the next slide, you can see how uh, everything is um, 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 managed through this uh, um, currently how the, this thing is governed. So the ultimate, um, the the organ, uh, the the ultimate uh, sponsors in the current CUI framework is managed by the EVPRP and the CIO here at Purdue. So we have this uh, executive oversight committee, and they basically making the ultimate decisions. They including the defense lead, expert control office, sponsored office, and all that. And moving on, it go, goes down to the uh, program level. And there, uh, over there, you will be able to see the regulated program manager, the ISSM, uh, ISO, and the various uh, project teams. And the very important thing is you actually have to have the stakeholders group. So you have to identify what are different uh, stakeholders in the, this uh, CUI framework. And uh, you always have those Euro suspects there, like research computing operators, IRB infrastructure, endpoint support. And I think to many, the surprises there is actually libraries and uh, libraries. It turns out here at Purdue, we have something like a hub zero. So libraries are actually have a, a very active part when it comes to manage uh, some of the public data. So we actually have to bring the, um, uh, the management, uh, the libraries on the on board as well, and uh, some of the recent, uh, some of the questions we have to ask is, well, how much money does it cost, and how's their role in terms of this entire CUI framework, and uh, so so there is a, a formalized relationship eventually established about the data management and training, because uh, even in the library when they do the data management, some of the data might have this uh, um, a PHI level information about their um, uh, protected health information. So research was able to you know provide HPC resources and provide help to students using the existing uh, existing. A standardized framework like high trust and CMMC. So that's basically it talks about how we kind of grow this uh, ecosystem within uh, Purdue University. And we realize that's not a sufficient. We actually making this uh, uh, needs to go to even bigger uh, impact. So that's going to be the part three of our talk is uh, from the ecosystem to community where Carolyn is going to talk about how could we create an even bigger comp uh, impact. Thank you. Thanks, um, Justin. And uh, what uh, we've got a question here about sharing a high-level sanitized network diagram of the read uh, environment. I'm not sure if that's coming later or if maybe we could point someone to a link um, on the Purdue website. 
Yeah, I will probably. Um, yeah, this is could be done uh, later um, after after talk. Uh, I need to. Uh, I think Preston and uh, Caroline will probably have a bigger uh, have better idea about this question. Okay, thanks. Um, so we had some question, um, a two part question about CUI and HIPAA that Carolyn answered, but I just want to read it uh, briefly to capture it for the recording. Um, in the award CUI and HIPAA, it's very interesting. Do the panelists feel a NIST 800-171 design system can appropriately meet all the current HIPAA requirements or uh, with only modest controls added to the 800-171 system? Uh, one system that meets both would be great. Uh, second part, what about NIST 800-53 if operating a federal IT system under contract? So the, the answer was, uh, we had briefly gone down the path for one system for HIPAA and CUI, but the controls like, quote, no split tunneling stopped us from um, trying to sell that to the HIPAA researchers. Ecosystem to us means interconnected versus all-in-one, leverage some of the same systems where possible. Um, and then we have a, a response, thanks, we're finding more HIPAA date usage Data usage requirements are now including HIPAA plus plus requirements pointing to a NIST 800 regulations. Uh, we are currently running a HIPAA system through some NIST 853 controls. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so let's move on to, to um, oh wait, we've got one more question here. Have you implemented a 800-171 environment for your financial aid CUI? I would say no, and we are watching that um, all those discussions start up and eek. <laughs> that's, a, that's about where I'm at right now with that. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on to Carolyn. Sure. Um, so I'm Carolyn Ellis. I'm a program manager with our regulated research program, and I've actually been with the program since the read AWS environment proof of concept that you first learned about. And while our framework provided much of the glue within the regulated ecosystem, until these workshops I'm discussing, much of the benefit remained strictly at Purdue. Uh, next slide. So two and a half years ago, I created Higher Ed CUI Slack community. And I did this because I was looking for where the communication was taking place beyond the conferences. And honestly, I just couldn't find it. So uh, conversations seemed mostly to be existing, uh, let's see, in small settings where it was a consultation between two institutions. Let's talk about how you implemented the AD controls within the space, or tell me about your architecture, your networking. Very very um, targeted conversations, but just held with the two universities. And there were also lots of decent talks at conferences, but my issue there was they were very small subsets within the full population we just mentioned in the governance slide. Uh, so for example, you'd have export control officers only sharing information with their peers at AU Echo or the Big Ten CISOs, educa security professionals, CASC, they're all small subsets of the, the bigger population. And that's where they would share, hey, we're doing this great new thing in creating these environments. Uh, so next slide. All right, so here's where the good old COVID plot twist comes in for us. So about a year ago, all of our well-established plans for outreach and dissemination changed quite a bit. Um, our speaking engagements at conferences were canceled. Our student employees returned home and then they graduated. The hiring pool for additional students vanished as we instantly went into a hiring freeze. And without the spending going down as planned, we were forced to pivot just like everyone else. Uh, so Preston put me in contact with a facilitation group that he had worked with on a recent uh, successful virtual workshop. And we initially considered, should we do a half day? Should we do a full day? But when it comes down to it, those probably would have looked much like the conferences that were canceled. 
where you learn a whole lot about what someone else is doing, but you also leave recognizing that your own environment comes with its unique set of circumstances that may or may not fit what you just learned. So we ended up selecting many workshops due to the community's maturity, meaning we were all isolated. Actually, you could stay on the previous one for a second. Um, so after all, we do recognize that regulated research is just a fraction of our services and we're all wearing multiple hats. So we set up a website and we started recruiting from essentially our own network who we've done cons cons consulting with, um, the CAS groups. We put out a message at the COGR meeting. Uh, we put out some messages within the EDUCAUSE community groups. We're just looking for where, where the people were that would want to help. And so now we could go with the next one. All right, so we decided to structure it as six mini workshops and mini was around 90 minutes to two hours each. And these are all facilitated through no innovation. And we, we set out with the primary goal was to develop collaboration venues among those building and supporting the regulated research environments. First step, I brought, brought on three university leaders to help me lead and organize these workshops. These leaders, we have Eric Dumans of University of Florida, Anurag Shankar of Indiana University and Trusted CI, and Jay Galman of Duke University. Additionally, we have two uh, facilitators from No Innovation, and that's Tim Dunn and Anne Marie Boss. And honestly, I am so grateful for this team because there's absolutely no way I could have done this on my own. So, next slide. So, let's see. In early November, we held our first workshop. And to date, we've had 91 people from 52 different institutions who have registered for our workshops. Additionally, we've completed four out of the six workshops and the feedback so far has been remarkably positive. Attendance has regularly been around 50 and the website also collected some basic um, information as people all registered. I threw together a few word clouds prior to workshop one in order to introduce ourselves to each other. This one shows the diversity of the roles participating. And what was great to see was we're collecting a whole lot of perspectives from the end-to-end -end program management. We have CISOs, we have export control officers, security compliance managers, a variety of export um, executive directors of research computing, and we even have some contract managers. Um, next slide. This one I love, I love to show. This one is a representation of the 52 institutions that are participating. Hopefully you see your school. If you don't um, and you wanna stay tuned for our outputs, let me know. My email will be on the final question slide. Happy to, happy to bring you into that loop. Uh, next one. This one I found is fascinating. So the question was, what do you see as the biggest value from bringing this community together? And most people threw in a paragraph or a fairly long answer on this. And this was the resulting word cloud. And it became clear that something driving, driving us was the information sharing, discovering best practices, and learning from others facing similar challenges. All right, next one. All right, well, as simple as this is, this is the meat of probably my talk, the approach. So at the first workshop, uh, we divided participants into six smaller groups. People self-selected their, their group by variables such as if your work was primarily biomedical or Department of Defense. We also had them choose by if their role was more technical or business. And then also the final, 
variable was your program maturity for, of your institution. And from there, we got together and we documented what our current challenges were as individuals. Within that bird of feather group, we, we discussed those challenges and then we picked a few of the highest priority ones. When the small groups were actually reporting back to the full audience, we started hearing many of the similarities. Um, so for example, the three business side groups all produced very similar sets of results as did the, um, the three technical groups. Now those two weren't were identical to each other. There were there was definitely a line of technical and business, but to me that meant that the focus on the regulations and the program maturity were not what separated the group. So that that knowing that actually altered how we proceeded, since we didn't have more. We realized we had more in common than differences. So leaving workshop one, that generated 73 challenges that were put into the inputs for 11 volunteers. And they placed each of those into affinity groups. And what I meant by that was out of the 73, you would pick these two belong together or these five belong together. So you would group them into whatever groups you wanted to group. And then no innovation measured the frequency of these items coming together and the likeness between these 11 result sets. These resulting affinity groups became seven categories that the community was currently spending their time on. Um, moving on to those, the two next gray boxes, they, at the second workshop, we shared where the cat or we shared the categories that we had produced between one and two. And then in new small groups, we added narrative around the seven categories. And we also developed exploratory questions to help that topic move forward. Then when we got back together where we were brainstorming as, as the full group, what could help? And sometimes that was resources that you could leverage, or sometimes it was um, ideas that we should learn more about in order to move that category forward. So workshops three and four, we started splitting off into longer term small groups in order to truly start focusing in on these newly titled pillars. So we spent the time um, so yeah, we, we pulled together larger, larger groups that would focus in on these pillars through the rest of the workshops. One of the interesting things we noticed early on was uh, we couldn't actually use the language best practices yet. And I think we realized that because they're institutional practices at this moment. Uh, we couldn't compare our personal institution store experiences yet until we shared alternative approaches. And we also then realized that we need to sift through some of the ways that they would impact or they would fit into someone else's environment too. So one of the powerful exercises we did was sharing our own experiences with the group in a very specific slice of their program. So for example, what have you done to build the training and education components? This is a talk that you would probably never hear at a, at a conference due to the fact that they usually remain very high level, that we implemented our program, we know what we were doing. Turns out, yeah, there's each of those slices that need a little more attention. So by hearing each other's stories, we were able to bring to light resources that the institutions had actually built um, that were sheltered from, from the community. And they could help. There, there's so many great things out there that we're learning that you guys have hidden away at your institutions too. Uh, so, so similar to what we built in the framework, we actually needed to bring these processes at, back to this bigger group and vet them. And here's some of the feedback of 
oh man, that's that's great that that works for you guys, but this might not work in our case. Okay. So moving forward to workshops five and six, which are coming later this month, or no, I guess April. So later April, and we're not there yet. And then workshop six, which will be early June. And so we'll be collecting feedback from other groups to strengthen each of the pillars. And then the final one, which I, I'm guessing a lot more people may come to that one of just to hear what's going on in this space. Um, we'll be producing, moving toward a white paper as our final output. And that white paper will be available late summer. Um, next slide. All right, so even though we're not done with these workshops, we are we are far, we have accomplished quite a few things. And to be honest, our outputs have really exceeded what I was anticipating when I even began planning these. The workshops have provided a depth that was missing from us to move from standalone institutions to having a group of peers who understand exactly what you're experiencing. Our biggest outcome so far has been the early creation of a community of practice. And most important, the next most important one in my opinion was realizing that we have more similarities than differences. While some of us may have a few more lessons learned than others, um, we all have very similar challenges of growing our programs. So back to, it, didn't, it did not matter on the biosystem, medic, biomedical or the Department of Defense, nor maturity. Those things all came out in the wash of we, we had similar challenges that we were facing. So I listed out the, the pillars that we have come up with and they're specifically ordered in terms of broadest to most specific. And these key ones are the ownership and roles, the cost and financial impact, training programs, audit and assessment, the individual interpretation of the controls and scoping the security boundary. And I had mentioned on the previous slide that we had come up with seven affinity groups. The one that didn't make the final pillar was where to start. And we determined that that gets filled in as you develop your six pillars. One thing that was interesting was recently I've had some conversations that made me realize the pillars that we arrived at also are very similar to the folks that are securing our critical infrastructure and the challenges that they're facing. So I think that might be a, an interesting group of expansion when we, we grow out this community. All right, for my final slide, we have, what does the future look like? And this is what my crystal, what, what I'm seeing in my crystal ball. And these workshops to me have shown the value of expanding beyond our own institution for resources. Um, I would like to see a more formal and sustainable means of continuing the amazing strides we, we made in these six workshops. And I'd also like to see the shift from institutional best practices to a regulated research community of practice, best practices. So currently I see regulated research program in the broader landscape operating very isolated and reactive. We're all likely sending an individual to the same webinars, having them read the same items to become our in-house CMMC expert. We've all been so focused on evolving our own programs. We haven't stepped back and realized our peers are struggling in the exact same ways. And the biggest issue with this community not working together in my opinion is we don't have a spot at the table for those regulations when they're being rolled out. And there isn't that awareness on how differently they impact us than businesses. So down the road, I would like to see a community of practice where we could help smaller institutions leverage 
our existing lessons learned or business processes. Um, I think there's a lot of cost savings that could be brought together from the efficiencies of leveraging the distributed expertise. And the ultimate metric of success, in my opinion, would be if our voice is heard and represented as these new regulations are being rolled out. So that's my crystal ball. I suppose you can go to the next slide. That one's just the... What questions do we have? I covered a whole lot quickly. <laughs> Yeah, so let's um, give people a moment to uh, to type and then I'll um, these slides I'll, I'll throw up the slides link real quick again, so that people can if they want to contact you, they can find it right away. Um, let me uh, grab the screen and we'll just go over a few um, a few uh, items of business. Uh, um, can you see the, the question slide. Yes. Great, thank you. So yeah, if, if we're taking questions now, go ahead and type them in. Um, I have a few community updates. Uh, first, uh, the trusted the next Trust CI webinar is Monday, April 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern. And this is a, a, a presentation on, on the Science DMC at Arizona State University. And the presenter is uh, Douglas Janewin. And then um, also, um, Research SOC, um, the Research Security Operations Center, um, has a, an upcoming webinar H April 22nd at 3 p.m. Eastern, Open Source Tools We Like, a conversation with the Research SOC project liaisons. So if you're interested in um, open source tools, this would be a good opportunity for you to uh, join that webinar. And then April 2nd, um, we have the Trusted CI engagement applications for the second half of 2021 are due. Um, if you are interested in engaging with Trusted CI, go ahead and um, go to trustedci.org slash application. And then um, another um, security, um, cybersecurity webinar that we've been promoting is this uh, base cybersecurity webinar. They, their, their format is uh, in the form of kind of a webinar slash office hours. So if you are interested, you can go to basesecurity.org slash page slash webinars. And any questions about the Trusted CI webinar series, uh, you could go to trustedci.org slash webinars, or you can email us at webinars at trustedci.org. And it looks like we've got some activity going on in the chat here. So um, let's see, uh, have you implemented an 800? Oh, we've already done that financial aid question. Here we go. Um, how do you charge? We've got a question about charging. Um, I'm, I'm assuming for attending the workshop. No, I'm sure. I'm sure the question is our cost model, or okay, uh, how are we charging back for use of the environment? And Preston, I suspect you would love to chat on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I commented that um, at the end of my section that the, the the real sticky problems in doing these CUI environments are not the I, the IT problems, and this is certainly one of the <laughs> has been one of the most contentious ones on campus. Um, so with largely because it was a ver by virtue of how we'd set it up in AWS, where we weren't leveraging any of our existing uh, business processes, we had landed into a full cost recovery um, cost model, um, which was expensive. Uh, even after we went on-prem, we went uh, to an unsubsidized cost recovery model, uh, where it still wound up being, I think, 13K or so per project um, per year to get into the environment, which is way better than 38K a year plus AWS costs, but still it was, when the faculty members are getting 50K, 100K grants, and they're immediately needing to spend 13 of it just to get into the computing environment, it just wasn't cost effective. So currently we're, we're in a model where the out-of-pocket costs that are direct charged are fully subsidized by the vice president for research. Um, and the, the, I guess the, the variable costs. So when a researcher needs to buy resources to to do large simulations. It's effectively just like our, our community cluster, our condo computing program. So if I am, if I have a contract where I'm doing CFD for a hypersonics grant that requires CUI, um, the VPR is covering the cost to get into the environment, but I still need to budget for the cost of the compute nodes. So it's just like a condo program at that point. Does that answer your question? 
Um, we'll see uh, what the reply is. All right. Um, we've got another question here uh, regarding Replus. How are you supporting interactive computing? Um, for example, the use of Windows CAD based software. I'll only grab that one too, Carolyn. Oh, is that CAD? <laughs> is that like the architecture yep. software? Okay. Yeah, so um, so interactive computing generally, the, that's the, the that, that's the base the, the basic way that we that we that we have researchers interact with the system. We use a project a product called uh, FinLink from Sendio, which is an accelerated um, remote desktop software for for Linux. Uh, so the users interact with a, a Linux desktop, but for Windows specific applications, we do have have tools in place for them to be able to launch. Um, Windows virtual machines from the from the cluster, whether as a batch job or directly on the interactive nodes. Um, and there's a number of of scientific applications that are already um, installed on there. If there's not a Linux equivalent, and uh, Windows CAD software, I believe is is one of the one of the exact um, use cases that we have for that. I haven't used CAD since high school. <laughs> um. So we've got a comment here to the team. Uh, lots of great information in this talk. Thanks to the panelists. Um, let's do a last call for questions. Um, any any comments? Um, any uh, Preston, Justin, or Carolyn that you want to uh, present uh, before wrapping things up? Um, Okay, so last call for, oh, we've got, um, what's the best way to get connected with this community? So um, Brandon, I'm gonna just throw the, the link to the slides one more time. Um, Carolyn has a, on the last slide of the presentation, there are email addresses uh, to get connected. Um, any other ways that you would like them to contact you or get connected with the community? Um, there are, I don't know if they've expired yet or not. Slack has recently changed things, but I, I can also share the Slack invite with pretty much anyone who's looking to hop on there. There's There's been some great discussion recently in the last year. It's mostly been CMMC focused, but um, yeah, good good place to connect with other very similar people. And then when moving forward with the the workshops and their outputs, we will share that in as many venues as we can possibly um, distribute it to. <laughs> Trusted CI will certainly be uh, one that will be getting their hands on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you send me the, the Slack link, I can uh, include it in the email when I send out the recording of this. And there was a question, will it be recorded? Yes, it's being recorded and I'll be sending it out later today. Um, Sounds so good, I'll do that. Thank you. And then we've got a couple more questions here. Would you consider going back to a cloud if a subsidy was available to make costs more equal? Um, I would I would go out on a limb and say that we would be open to the idea, but I think you know now knowing what we know today, I think we'd be a lot more mindful about what our what our what our skills available that we have. Um, we are we do have other places within central IT that, that is building some more more experience and doing things more cloud native. So we may be in a better we may be in a better position to be able to staff that, but we'd have to weigh that very carefully with just the incremental amount of work, the, the measuring that versus the incremental work for just using our existing investment in HPC. Mm -hmm. And then we've got kind of a two parter here. You said VPR is subsidizing startup costs. Uh, what does that cover if you still have to buy the compute nodes? And then where does the funding come from for the compute nodes? Yeah. So what the so what the um, what the VPR subsidy is covering is basically just the cost to enter the environment. You get access to the shared storage, a small number of, of pre-existing compute nodes and the interactive login nodes. So you're basically, you're basically paying for the fixed costs of the storage and the compliance. Um, but most of the contracts that we've seen aren't ones that require large amounts of capacity for high, high performance computing. They're just some, somewhere that needs to load up R or MATLAB or SolidWorks or whatever the tool might be. And have their data in a place that's that's appropriately secured. Um, the other piece of that with the funding for the compute nodes, um, the expectation is that the faculty that require large amounts of computing need to build that into their budgets. 
Uh, most of the people that are that are that are doing that that require high performance computing are most the all the ones that we've seen today are ones with an existing track record in our condo hpc program so they're already used to, to budgeting for their variable costs of compute nodes um, and then it just becomes a question of you 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 budget your cost the same way whether it's it's open or, or controlled research and then it just lands in the control in the controlled system if if the contract requires it um Okay, we've got a couple more questions. We'll try to get through them quickly. Uh, how would you do cloud or HPC when connection to instruments is required for a research project? Inst I'm sorry, connection to instrumentation is required for a research project. Um, that's a good question, Carolyn. Um, you you've had you worked with some of the folks with the engineering, like at the at the Zucro Labs. Um, can can you speak to what they've done? So far, the main main thing that we've had to work through is where where that networking line comes in, and we we did solve that one with a jump host recently, uh, so that that at least gives your instrumentation a a small small step away from being inside that the storage and <laughs> the environment with no internet. <laughs> Yeah, if if I might jump, jump in, and uh, I'm aware many of the projects that um, managed by the research computing, the firewall settings are very different, and there are multiple paths, and there are uh, specific um, uh, IDS software, IPS software uh, kind of installed um, to safeguard network connections and uh, um, looking for any kind of attack or security CUI information. So, so I, I guess um, the better way to answer your question would be, uh, it was mostly depends on each different program requirements, see whether the information, the data generated are um, CUI data or protected data or not. And it actually creating a separate uh, data environment um, to safeguard those data. That's basically uh, something being handled by the research computing team. They, they did a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, we've got one more question. Uh, we're starting to look at CMMC level three compliance. Do you have recommended resource for the process document templates to address documented and managed levels of each practice? I would say that the people most most uh, position to answer that aren't aren't on the call at the moment. Um, that would be our compliance analysts who who have much of that weight on their shoulders. Um, do you have a moment to stick around for a couple more questions? We've got a few more that came in. I'm fine with it. Okay. Uh, going back to the instrumentation, is it fully no internet? We're trying to design a way right now for project environments to research our SaaS auth provider. Uh, curious if others have tackled selective egress like this. Oh, I'm not sure I have a great answer on that one. I, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of We've certainly struggled in that space of our interpretation has been a very, very defined um, places that it could could go. And right now, um, it's no internet out, which means to us, it's just the approved um, venue, venues from the sponsor who might pick up their report or do reporting to but even with licensing it was it's very specific to here's our purdue license server and going into that once you start going into outside providers I, i'm not i'm not quite sure on how to on how, where to help on that one yet yeah. Yeah, I think in a really abstract sense, you know, I think like like Carolyn's saying, we we do open holes to certain things. We do have an entire process in the system security plan for for documenting and allowing those sorts of things. I don't really know off the top of my head without looking at it if there's any if we specifically 
have anything for like a software as a service provider, or if it's all things that are um, either a local licensed server or something that the sponsor requires, like a, you know, a collaboration tool for delivering documents, for example. Um, and then one more here we've got with all the new responsibilities to manage the new environments, cloud and on-premise, uh, what uh, staffing positions were instituted, if any? I would say um, instantly we, we started having a closer relationship with our security compliance team. Uh, previous to that, we had, we had operated much along the lines of research computing was a separate entity. And now there are good buddies. Yeah, probably more specifically, we did, we did eventually get funding for a you know, rough, roughly an FTE of, of, of new technical expertise to help with this, with this environment, but in practice is shared among a couple of bodies. Um, the security group already had some folks in place, probably about when we were starting to stand up the AWS system. Uh, there are two shared resources between the export control office and the, and the IT security group that play a large role in a lot of this sort of stuff. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanna say um, thank you, Preston, Justin, Carolyn for um, presenting. Um, I think the um, audience got a lot out of this presentation. Um, any uh, last minute comments before we um, wrap things up? No, thank you guys so much. This has been a delight being able to share the message. Absolutely. And I'll, I will be sending out an email later today with the link to the recording and the Slack just to help people get connected. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. And um, thanks for, for those of you who joined. Um, have a great day.